we're back with another Pico CTF challenge. Stonks. I decided to try something no one else had before. I made a bot to automatically trade stonks for me using AI and machine learning. I wouldn't believe you if you told me it's insecure. We have a file that I've already downloaded, and we have a server that we can hit using Netcat. So we'll come over here, and we'll get a terminal. There's the file that I already pre-downloaded. We'll look at that in a minute. First, we're going to interact with this, and we're going to see what exactly it does. So we're using Netcat, we're calling the server. Uh, I'd like to view my portfolio first. I don't own any stocks. Okay, let's try it again. This time let's buy stocks by pressing one. What is my API token? I don't know, so let's just put in gibberish. And it decided to buy these shares for me. Okay, what happens, for example, if I give some other number like three, goodbye. Okay, so let's look at the source code for this and try to get a sense of what it's doing. And the best place to start is if we find the main function as we head down. Here's the main, and we'll just read it from the top, working our way down. Uh, set buff, I don't really know. S random, yeah, I don't know either. We're initializing our portfolio. We're checking to make sure that it's not null. Okay. Uh, we have a response. We print out the prompt we saw. Do we want to buy stocks or view the portfolio? Scan takes input from the command line, so it's going to take an integer. Uh, D stands for integer, because of course and it's going to put it into this integer box variable that we, uh, we signed for it. If we choose one, we go in and we buy stocks. If we choose two, we view the portfolio, then it looks like it frees up the space it allocated, and it says goodbye. So when you're looking at something like this, what you're interested in is the points where you can give input, because uh, generally a program is gonna run the exact same each time, and it's probably not gonna just give you whatever access you want. You need to make some changes, you need to give it input it didn't expect. So the first thing I'm looking at is, we have this input that we give it. But I don't see any advantage to giving it something other than one or two. I mean, we just free up the portfolio and we say goodbye. So the other place that we happen to give input is when we buy stocks, and we'll, we'll look for where this is defined. So here we check to make sure we have a portfolio. We allocate space. So this is an array the size of flag buffer, which I saw up above, 128 characters. We open a file on the server and we read it and we find out here this is the flag file so if we can't find the flag file we complain we write that into the api buff buffer so that's now available there so that's really what we're interested in getting so the question is how can we get that uh, we look at how much money we have we look at how many shares we have while we still have money we take a share at random it looks like so random percent money uh, We pick the symbol. Let's see what this guy does. So it takes the number of shares we want. It seems to just generate a random symbol. So I'm looking down here. So we, we say we're going to have a stock. It's going to have a number of shares, which we said. It doesn't make sense to have less than one. So if that happened, we would just return. And then our symbol length is going to be random. As many as four, it seems. And we are going to generate that symbol by randomly picking. So we start at A, so this is ASCII, 65, and 26 is the length of the alphabet, so we're going to pick a random number, and it's going to be an offset up to 26. And we set a pointer for the next stock to be null, and we return the stock. Okay, so I, I didn't see anything really there. So we seem to just be using up all our money to create stocks. Then we get down here. And we have our input. And so this is this is the actual interesting part. And we can see right here, there's a to-do. So programmers will put this in when they have uh, future work that they haven't already accomplished. So it's like a to-do list. And then you can often find to-dos in, in a global list. Or you can just search the file. So figure out how to read token from file. For now, just ask. So they're asking for it. What is your API token? Scan, again, reads it into the buffer. We've allocated up to 301 spots on the stack. We'll talk about that in a minute. And we're taking. Uh, so this is a format string, and it's saying a width of up to 300 items. It's going to be treated as a string. So remember, you can interpret information in any number of ways. So 65 could be actually 65. 65 could be a capital A, like we saw above. It could be many different things. So we're going to read that in. We're going to print the token that we're using, using printf. And then we're going to view our portfolio. So at this point, I started thinking of this is the other place where we have input. So we want to really look and think, what can we do here? And how does this user buff get used? 
And the answer is it's only used, it's read into, and then it's printed, and then it's never used again. And it doesn't seem to have any cascading effect where like we use user buff in another variable or anything like that. So it lives and dies here. So I started thinking, can I do a buffer overflow? And the answer is no, because it's specifying the maximum size that it'll take. It'll only take up to 300 characters and it allocates 300 characters. So no good there. But the printf we can use. And I have a nice visualization that I put together over in open sense. Uh, perfect, there we go. So what you need to know about, um, for this problem, you need to understand that there's a stack. And the stack is where we store things. So for example, if we're executing this code here and we create a local variable called uh, x, we're gonna actually push that onto the stack. So this is, each of these entries are 32 bits wide. They could be 64 bits, it's uh, machine dependent. But you have this uh, base pointer, which tells you where your stack frame begins. A uh, stack frame denotes this function, what its bounds are and, and what it can see and what makes sense for it. So we would start with a stack pointer pointing like here, we would say, oh, I need an X variable. Okay, I'll push that on the stack and I'll increment my stack pointer. Then we have a flag that we know we read in from uh, the file and we make space for it. So we said we make 128 um, bits of space for it. So let's just say this is 128 bits. So we would allocate the space and then we would use it to hold Pico CTF our flag. Now we call it a print string and we can control what goes into this because it's our user input. And printf, it allows format strings, which I'll show you in a minute, but this is a format string to take hex uh, arguments. Normally, what you would expect is you're calling for four hex numbers. You would expect to be passed, uh, let's say f, we'll do another one. Uh, these are just hex numbers, e, you'd expect to be passed four of them. And then they would be each put on the stack and you'd make your function call. So just to quickly show you one example, you would push your first argument, you would push that uh, ox f onto the stack, you push all those, and then you would call this function. And the function is gonna find its arguments on the stack. And it's gonna say, okay, I print off oxf and oxe and all these guys. What happens is when you leave this off, when you don't provide arguments, instead, it just grabs whatever it can find on the stack, which allows us to read the entire stack down. So it's gonna say, oh, the first hexadecimal number. All right, well, here's one. I need more though. And it continues down. And, and so we'll read Pico CTF in hex. All right, so let's actually do that now. Let's go back over to Kali. And we'll just quickly show you what I was talking about. So uh, printf, actually I'm looking for a table. Table would be really nice. Uh, this shows the different uh, arguments that you can pass in. So you use a percent sign, then you can do a width like we saw with the 300, so 300 characters, and then an S is a string of characters. In this case, we're gonna do a lot of unsigned hex integers to read off the stack that we just saw. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into Python and I'm going to, rather than typing this all out, actually, let me, let me show you how little fun this would be if we were to do it this way. So I'm gonna go and use netcat. We're gonna tell it to buy stocks. And what is my API token? So right now we're at this point. It's asking, what is your API token? And I want to have everything on the stack printed off so that I can look at it and I can find my variable, my flag. I don't want to type that. So instead, I'm going to use Python and I'll just say, I want this string and I want it 100 times. And then I'll use copy and paste. And we'll go over here and we'll paste it. Let's make this bigger so we can see. And we can see we dumped a ton of the stack, but it's all in hex. We can't read this. So what we should do is we should take this into something that can read hex and we should see if there's anything meaningful in here. We should dump it in and here we can see the hex interpreted as ASCII. And you can see a lot of crazy symbols because this is just random hex. It, it could be anything. You see the integration sign there, but you can also see Pico CTF. It, it kind of looks like a flag, but it's backwards. So why is it backwards and how do we fix it? Well, the answer is it's backwards because it's, uh, it's not displayed exactly in the way that I showed you. So I, I kind of simplified things. Let's delete this guy. So these are 32 bits, right? And to represent ASCII requires 127, uh, up to 127 uh, in decimal. So between zero and 127, that's ASCII. And that's lowercase numbers, uppercase numbers, spaces, numbers, characters, things like that. So that works out to be uh, eight bytes each. So you need eight, 
excuse me, 8 bits to represent each ASCII character. So when you have something like Pico, so each one of these is 8 bits, and we set a box is 32 bits, so you can store up to 4 in it. Now the issue is, things can be stored multiple ways by the, the computer. This makes sense, and so this is the way that I laid it out for us. But for the computer, it makes every bit as much sense to store it backwards and then just fix it when it reads it out. So the first ASCII character would be O, which is what we're, we're seeing, C, I, P, and they would all similarly be reversed. And so each block of four characters is reversed, but the overall string still uh, is in order. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, don't worry, I'll show you. So I started working on a way to reverse this, and we'll do it manually first, and then we will use some code to actually do it uh, a bit better. So like we said, four characters each. So one, two, three, four, we hit enter. One, two, three, four, hit enter, hit enter. We're just breaking this up into blocks. Four, one, two, three, four. And uh, I would recommend, if you don't have to program, I wouldn't just because um, you'll spend a lot of time in all likelihood doing so. And unless you're doing this a lot, it doesn't make sense to automate it and put in that time. So now what we need to do is we need to reverse each of these strings. So for example, this is P-I-C-O. The next one is C-T-F. Again, I'm just reading this character and then this character and then this character. I underscore L-O. You get the idea. So I actually, I wrote some code because I don't want to do that every time. And I'm going to go down here. I'm going to put it in and we'll walk through the code after I get done with it. And I'll explain how it works and, and why it works. We'll comment this out. Look at our output from what we just ran. And we see it's Pico CTF. I lost all my money, one CTF. And then we have some garbage characters at the end. So let's try this and then let's walk through the code. Make sure this is accepted. All right, so that worked. So when you look at the code, we're using Python here, and we have our jumbled flag, which we grabbed out from our hex, and we break it up into four character blocks. So I create a list of all the blocks, and then uh, I'm looping over at increments of four, so zero, four, eight, uh, 12. I'm looping through, and I'm, excuse me, grabbing out chunks of four, and I'm adding them as strings. So this is a string conversion to the blocks. So just quickly to show you what this looks like, we'll step-by-step -step debug through. So I will be zero initially, as you can see over there. Let me expand this out. And we're gonna take from I to the very end of the string. This could definitely be done more efficiently, but this is the way I chose to do it. So that's, that's the whole string. And we're gonna see if its length is greater than four. And if it is, we are only gonna take the first four characters. So it is greater than four. So we only take the first four characters. So we can see now our chunk is just the, the Pico reversed. And we are gonna append that to our blocks. And if you look at block, Ah, over there is better. You can see Pico. And so we're going to continue through until the very end. You can see them all coming. I'm going to set a run point to here, and we're going to run through. OK, so we have all our blocks going all the way down. Now what we need to do is reverse them. And we're going to put them in this flag variable. So this is a special Python syntax to go from the back to the front. Uh, so it's going to reverse it and we're going to add them all to flag this variable, which you're going to see I'm hovering over it right now. So flag is Pico, CTF, it's not updating, I lost all my money. So there you go. Hopefully that was helpful. You learned something about the stack, you learned about format C, uh, or C printf in the format strings, you learned a bit of Python. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. Bye.